Tonight we're going to be studying together the subject of the Jehovah's Witnesses and specifically the terms and texts which they warp, which they take out of context, which they redefine, misapply, violate all the laws of exegesis and interpretation to enforce as their doctrine, and which quite frequently confuses the average Christian. And the best way to deal with it is simply to list some of these passages and then to present them as a Jehovah's Witness would use them. This is a Watchtower presentation. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus Christ is the first and the greatest creation of Jehovah God, the Archangel Michael, and that he does not share the nature of God. He was created by Jehovah before all worlds and raised to the rank of divinity. While he lived here on earth, he was a perfect man, the last Adam. And there are many passages which demonstrate the Watchtower's position. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 is a classic Watchtower passage. That passage reads, Thus says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 1, and you can follow the Watchtower's logic. Scripture says, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth. The faithful witness is Jesus Christ. Well, if he's the faithful witness, he is the beginning of the creation of God. If he's the beginning of the creation of God, he cannot be the creator, because the creator does not have a beginning. Now, we know that Jesus Christ created all things, but we know also that it was Jehovah God who created through him. That's why we find in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that Jehovah created all things through the king Christ Jesus. By him also he made the world. So, Jesus of Nazareth is the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God, but he is not Jehovah God living in the flesh. Jehovah is only the Father, and that is specifically stated in 2 Peter chapter 1. God, or Jehovah, the Father. Son is not called Jehovah in Watchtower theology. One need only look at Christ's statement in John chapter 14, verse 28, where he says, I am going to my Father, because my Father is greater than I. Well, if the Father is greater than the Son, obviously Christ cannot be equal with God. That's why Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in a form of God, thought it not something to be grasped after, to be equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a slave. So Christ Jesus did not seek to grasp for equality with God. Christ Jesus knew his position. He was the highest of all creations. Now, many times theologians in Christendom speak of Jesus Christ as the power and wisdom of God. That is quite properly so. I cite in support of this 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Jesus is called the power and the wisdom of God. But how many people are aware of the fact that when you go back to the source of that in Proverbs chapter 8, it specifically says, Jehovah possessed me or created me in the beginning of his ways. I was set up before of old time, before all creation. Who is speaking? Wisdom. So you see, Jesus Christ is divine wisdom. Christ, the power and the wisdom of God, set up by Jehovah to be his chief representative, the one who would come into the world and specifically reveal his will. One of the most convincing of all passages is Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. Now, you ought to circle that word first. Born, because if he is the firstborn of all creation, it's pretty obvious, since the word firstborn means the first one born, that he is a creature. Jesus obviously never prayed to himself. He always prayed to God. The voice of the Father came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But one of the most devastating passages in the Bible that destroys the religionists and the Trinitarian arguments concerning Jesus, found in John chapter 5, where the scripture says, as the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son 
to have life in himself. All right, the Father has life in himself. We agree. And he gave the Son to have life in himself, which means that the Son derives his life from who? The Father, Jehovah God. That's why Jesus cannot be God himself. He derived his life from Jehovah God. That's very, very clearly stated. Jesus also said, I don't know the day or the hour of my return. He didn't know who touched him in a crowd. But Jehovah knew all of these things because Jehovah is all-knowing. Jehovah is always present. Jehovah is all-powerful. During his earthly life, Jesus was not so. Therefore, he was not Jehovah God. Philippians chapter 2 says that he was there a man who became a slave and was willing to serve Jehovah. Now, I think it's possible to go on citing many passages in the Old and the New Testament concerning Messiah. But John 1.1 1, 1 brings it all together because it says that the Word was with God and the Word was divine or the Word was a God. And the Watchtower Society, citing other scholars, has pointed out that if the Word was divine or the Word was a God, Obviously, he could not be the God with whom he was. Otherwise, you would have hopeless contradiction. So Jesus is a second God. John 1.18 says in the Greek text, Only begotten God. So Jesus is the only begotten God. And therefore, he is begotten by the Father before all worlds. And he is a God. It's perfectly proper for him to be called a God. Because in John chapter 10... Jesus said that the rulers of Israel were called God and that he himself could be called Son of God if they could be called gods simply because the Word of God came to them. Christendom teaches that Jesus rose from the dead in a physical form. The Bible doesn't teach this. Actually, the Bible says that Jesus rose from the dead as an immortal spirit creature and that he manufactured bodies that looked like his own body in order to inspire faith in his followers. You say, oh, but where do you prove that from the Scripture? Very simple. Mary Magdalene met Jesus after his resurrection. Did she not? She looked into his face. Did she not? She spoke with him. Did she not? How is it then that Mary Magdalene, seeing him after the resurrection, looked upon him and supposed him to be the gardener, and said, Sir, tell me where you have laid him. If it was the same body that Jesus had, then Mary would have recognized. But she didn't. Therefore, it was not the same body. Also, Scripture goes on to say that the disciples who walked on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24, when they walked with Jesus, did not know it was Jesus. Correct? Absolutely. How do we know that? Because he walked with them and talked with them, and they did not know until he prayed with them and until they were breaking bread, and then he revealed himself and disappeared from their sight. How can you walk with somebody? How can you talk with somebody? How can you listen to somebody? How can they preach to you? You can look at them, and you cannot tell that it's a person you have known, your master, the Son of God, whom you've seen work miracles. Disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't know him because Jesus had a different body. Now, if you want proof of that, Mark chapter 16 proves it beyond a question of a doubt. And I'd like you to look for a second at that particular passage. Mark chapter 16, verse 11. When they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they believed not. After that, he, Jesus, appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. Obviously, a direct reference to the road to Emmaus account as recorded in Luke chapter 24. So here is absolute biblical evidence that Jesus did not rise from the dead in the same form that hung on Calvary. And when Jesus entered the upper room, John chapter 20, the Bible says the doors were shut, yet he appeared in the room. If he had a body of flesh and bone as hung on the cross, how is it that he could materialize in that room? Doesn't the Bible say flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? If so, how is it possible for Jesus to have inherited the kingdom of God? That flesh, if he rose in a physical body. So these are things we have to face. We have to face 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. First man, Adam, 
was made a living soul, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So Jesus was raised from the dead, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. These are arguments based on Scripture. These aren't watchtower arguments. These are biblical arguments. Now, quite obviously, what you have heard is a forensic argument by a well-informed Jehovah's Witness. I could argue each one of the points vigorously, being very careful to quote passages out of context. You would know absolutely that I was wrong, but you wouldn't know most of the time where. And so, you see, it is not only important to know what we believe, it is equally important to know why we believe it. Now we will undertake to show why the Watchtower is wrong. And we have taken all of their best arguments virtually, and we will submit them to the careful scrutiny of biblical theology. So take your Bibles, and let's go through the very passages which I used, and let us take the biblical position versus the Watchtower argumentation. Number one, Revelation 3.14. The beginning of the creation of God. Much is made of the word beginning. Circle it in your Bible. In most modern translations, it's been corrected. It comes from the Greek word arche. And most modern translations have properly rendered it source or origin. So Jesus Christ is not the beginning of the creation of God. That is the first one. He is the origin or the source through whom all God's creation came. And that fits perfectly with Hebrews chapter 1. He created all things. He is the source, the origin of the creation of God. Cross-reference, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, if you want a good, strong argument against the Watchtower at this point, I suggest that you draw their attention to the fact that in John 1, 1, in their own New World translation of the Christian Greek Scriptures, they translated in the beginning, the Word was, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. The word translated beginning is exactly the word, arche, that is found in Revelation 3.14. And they translated in their own translation, beginning or origin. In the first edition of the Watchtower's translation, they translated it originally. The Word was. So the fact is, it's the same word that appears in Revelation 3.14. So if Jesus is the origin of the creation of God, or the source of the creation of God, He is not the first thing created. And if they can translate it origin in John 1, we can translate it origin in Revelation chapter 3. I cited a number of passages. Hebrews chapter 1, I used to support Revelation. There is no support there, but the way I used it out of context, it looked like that. I used it to prove that Jehovah created through Christ Jesus, and therefore, I attempted to prove from that that Christ Jesus was not Jehovah God or did not share the divine nature. That was the force of my argument. However, if you go to a good modern translation, you will find that it reads this way. And I'll go to the book of Hebrews and read it to you directly out of the Greek text, which I think would perhaps be the strongest way of doing it, although most modern translations have got it as it ought to be. The Greek text tells us that the Son... Verse 3, is the apogasma tes doxes, the radiant outshining of God's glory, and the character stamp of His very nature. Kai character tes hupastasios, which means that Jesus Christ is the very nature of God Himself stamped in human flesh. Ancient kings used to use their signet ring which was the only one of its kind in the world, made for them especially, to seal all documents because that was the identification of authenticity. All right, now, the writer of Hebrews, a scholar of the first water in Old Testament theology and customs, uses this illustration. He said, do you know who the Son of God really is? I will tell you. He is the impress in human flesh of the character and the nature of the invisible Jehovah. That's why Jesus could say, Have I been with you such a long time, Philip, and yet thou hast not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The whole impact of Hebrews chapter 1 is the direct opposite of what I told you as a Jehovah's Witness. The passage is really saying, 
that Jesus Christ is the radiance of Jehovah's Shekinah and the imprint of Jehovah's character and nature stamped in human flesh, God Himself living among us. Cross-reference, Colossians 2.9. For in Him dwells all the fullness of God Himself. Tes theotetos. Somatikos. In flesh. That's who He is. God in flesh. No way to escape those two passages. A good Greek interlinear translation. Jesus Christ is the nature of God in flesh. There's no way to escape that passage. So far from Hebrews chapter 1, proving that the Father created through the Son, and therefore the Son isn't God, the passage is saying, the Father created through the Son, who participated in the creation by virtue of the fact that He shares the nature of His Father. Jesus Christ shares and partakes of the fullness of the divine nature. Now we must use other passages in context to answer the witnesses. John 14, 28. My Father is greater than I. Jehovah's Witnesses say, there's your proof. The Father is greater than He is. Jesus said so. But the Father is greater than He is. He cannot be God. I refer you to Jehovah's Witnesses' own translation of Hebrews chapter 1. Cross-reference Hebrews chapter 1, where Jehovah's Witnesses correctly translate the Scriptures for a change in relation to the nature of the angels and the Son. It says, after Hebrews 1 verse 3, Jesus Christ made a purification for our sins. He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty in lofty places. So He has become better than the angels to the extent that he has inherited a name more excellent than theirs. The word better is the key to understanding the passage. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. The word in the Greek is kreton, K-R-E-I-T-T-O-N. The word in John 14, 28 is nazon, M-E-I-Z-O-N. Nazon is the term used to compare positions in that context. The Father was greater than the Son. Let's not get uptight about it. Jesus became a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Philippians chapter 2 says He emptied Himself and took upon Himself the form of a slave. Now, I quoted that passage before, playing the role of a Jehovah's Witness, to undermine the deity of Christ. Rather than undermining it, it demonstrates it, as is the case in many places. Because we are told here in Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus was better than the angels. That's a comparison of natures. But greater is a comparison of office. The Father was greater than the Son. Why? Because the Father was in heaven and was ruling the universe. The Son had laid aside the independent exercise of His attributes, the right to act as God. And He had poured Himself out and taken upon Himself our form. Humbling Himself as a slave, He went to the cross. And God the Father highly exalted him. I think that the Christian ought to mark that passage very clearly. Gerald Ford is President of the United States. And I think it could be said without fear of contradiction that by virtue of the office which he holds, he is greater than any person in this audience. Gerald Ford would be the last man to say that he was better than anybody in this audience. Because the moment that he said the word better, everybody would know he was talking about natures. And that's exactly what you find in Hebrews chapter 1. When you compare Jesus to the angels, you're talking about natures. Better than the angels. Why? He made them. Better than the angels? He created them. Even though positionally, you see the contrast? Positionally, he was lower than the angels. In his nature, he was what? Better than the angels. Why? He made them. But that's not true when he speaks of the Father. Jesus said, my Father is greater than I. He did not say, my Father is better than I. If he had said that, he would be inferior to the Father. And as such, he would not truly be God himself in human flesh. That's why the word was avoided. The contrast between the two words shouldn't be missed. I was very quick to use John 14, 28, and then I immediately leaped into Philippians chapter 2. You remember. All right, let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and let me show you what I leaped you over. First, I leaped you into a Jehovah's Witness argument. 
And the argument appears to be valid. He emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave. It's true. It also says he was found in fashion as a man. He was humiliated to the death of the cross. True. It also says in the same passage, we are to have the same mind that he had to be servants. That's true. But it says he did not think equality with God was something to be grasped for. And the answer to that is quite obvious. You do not grasp after what is already yours by inheritance. Hebrews chapter 1 says, By his inheritance he has obtained a more excellent name than they. Than who? The angels. Because in Hebrews 1, 6, when the Father brought him into the world, remember what we learned? He said, Let all the angels of God worship him. The Son is to be worshipped, not the angels. That's why John chapter 5 says, All men shall honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Whoever will not honor the Son, the same way he honors the Father, dishonors the Father, says the Gospel. It's precisely the position the Watchtower is in. It talks about Jesus and honoring him, but it dishonors him because it robs him of his rightful office. I quickly took you to Philippians 2. I read to a certain point, and then I got out of there as fast as I could. And the reason I got out as fast as I could is because, as a good watchtower follower, I knew that I would have a problem if I kept reading. So, when in doubt, dodge, invoking that sacred rule of watchtower reasoning, I left the passage immediately. I hope you didn't, because I want you to go back to Philippians chapter 2 with me and look at something that can be mutually advantageous and tremendously helpful when one is attempting to witness to a Jehovah's Witness. I'm sure that there are people saying, well, does this really do any good? You better believe it does. Does this get through to Watchtower people? Some of them. But I'll tell you what it accomplishes more than anything else. The planting of the seed of the Word of God. The piercing with the sword of the Spirit. The penetration of defenses that look impregnable, but in reality are extremely vulnerable. Appearances are deceiving. Don't let the Watchtower's apparent monolithic brainwash system scare you. They have not succeeded. Men are still capable of responding to the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. My word will not return to me empty. It will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God says it will produce what he has ordained. Dealing with the Jehovah's Witness, never forget that and never be discouraged. Look out for ripping something from its context. Dr. James Gray of Moody Bible Institute used to say, a text removed from its context becomes a pretext. And I would add to that, most generally for error. Look now at Philippians chapter 2 in your Bible. I think you'll see this quite clearly. Notice that I stopped reading when I got to the place where I was going to have to start quoting something that would be dangerous to the Watchtower's position. I stopped quoting after verse 8. He found himself in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient as far as death. Yes, death on a torture stake. I'm quoting the Watchtower's translation. For this very reason also God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. I stopped there very, very tactfully as a Jehovah's Witness. Because I didn't want to read the next one. So that in the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and every tongue should openly acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a direct quotation from Isaiah 45, 23. That would be very damaging. Who said it? Jehovah God. Unto me, says Jehovah, as I live, every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess. St. Paul, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, takes this and applies it to our Lord Jesus Christ and says, do you want to know who he really is? He is the Lord. He is Jehovah himself. Now, the Watchtower, believe it or not, has helped us tremendously at this point. In their own kingdom interlinear translation, they have stated something at the beginning which is of great value if the Christian will seize upon it. Discussing the divine name Jehovah or Yahweh, they say, How is a modern translator to know or determine when to render the Greek word kurios and theos into the divine name by determining where the inspired Christian writers have quoted from the Hebrew Scriptures. 
then he must refer back to the original to locate whether the divinity name appears there. This way he can determine the identity to give kurios and theos, and he can then clothe them with personality. Realizing that this is the time and place for it, we have followed this course in rendering our version of the Christian Greek scriptures. Close quote. Isn't that nice? They have gone back to the text and they have found where the name Jehovah appears. And then they have faithfully rendered it as kurios and acknowledged that that name in Greek is the transliteration for the Hebrew Jehovah. And here in Philippians 2, it reads in the Greek that every knee bends and every tongue swears or confesses. Jesu Christus Curios, capital Kappa. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God to the glory of God the Father. I suggest that you point that out. This is what blows the mind of a Jehovah's Witness who believes that this translation is the work of great scholarship. All you have to do is go to the Kingdom Interlinear Translation. Then go to Philippians chapter 2 in your New Testament. And you will find in the Greek of Philippians 2 verse 10. Excuse me, 11. Every tongue shall openly acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Kurios Jesus Christos. Es doxen theu patro. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God to the glory of God the Father. To that statement of the watchtower I can say, Amen. I want to assure you that's very seldom that we can say that. And there's right from the text itself with their own admission. Now we move on to some of their other things. I was quick to add Proverbs chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Christ the power and wisdom of God. It's a very old trick and that's what it is. To get your mind fixed on a word, remove the word from its context and not consider the context and then dive headlong into another context which has nothing whatsoever to do with the first one. The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the identity of Jesus Christ, power and wisdom of God. We already know from John 1.1, 1, 1, he is called God in human flesh. We also know that the word logos means the reason of God. A transliteration from the Targum of the Aramaic word Memra for wisdom or reason. So we know who Jesus Christ is from John 1. John says he is the, the Memra of God, the reason or the wisdom of God himself. There never was a time when God was separated from his wisdom any more than there could be a time when a man could be separated from his own wisdom. Obviously, if that occurred, he would cease to exist as an entity. So we have here the statement that Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Cross-reference, John 1. Logos equals memra, M-E-M-R-A, which is translated from Aramaic as wisdom or as reason. Now go to the context of Proverbs chapter 8. One, there is nothing in the passage which makes it messianic. Two, the burden of proof lies with the person who says there is. Where does it say that it is speaking of Jesus of Nazareth? Simply the word wisdom itself won't prove it, because if you read the beginning of the passage, you'll find out that wisdom is described in the female gender, and there are no female messiahs. So it's an abstraction for wisdom, a common usage in Hebrew poetry and figurative language to portray wisdom or knowledge or whatever they wanted to in terms of male or female gender. This is exactly what you got in Proverbs. And it's a female, not a male, so it's not messianic. That blows it up forever. Keep that thought fixed in your mind as you study the passage. The contexts are different. One is talking about abstract wisdom, philosophically, personified in the female gender, Proverbs 8. The other is talking about the identity of Messiah's divine nature, the power and wisdom of Jehovah himself. You can't put the two of them together and try and prove from these passages that Jesus is a creature. This isn't there. In fact, quite the opposite is there. I also made very swift use of Colossians chapter 1. And I made a great show on the word firstborn, which I asked you to circle in your Bible. 
firstborn of all creation. I'd like you to turn to Colossians chapter 1 for a moment. And I'd like you to remember that this passage, Colossians 1, 15, should be cross-referenced to the following Old Testament verses. Genesis 41, 51 and 52. And Jeremiah 31, verse 9. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. The name of the second he called Ephraim. The order is reversed in Jeremiah 31, 9. Ephraim becomes firstborn. How do you manage that? Manasseh was the first one born, and firstborn always means the first one born. Did Manasseh get unborn? Of course not. Then what does it mean? Well, the context, obviously, of Genesis is the context of the culture. What did the word firstborn mean in that culture? It meant preeminence. If a son, no matter what order he came in, was faithful to his father and his father's wishes, and his brothers who preceded him were not, he became firstborn and they lost their lineage. Manasseh apostatized, Ephraim became what? Heir to the preeminence. So the word firstborn, far from meaning always first one born, can indeed mean, particularly in a Jewish context, the preeminent one or the preeminent son. Now go to Colossians chapter 1 and you find that the scripture describing the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a perfect illustration of complete cultural congruity. Image of the invisible God, preeminent of all creation. Why is he preeminent over all creation? For by him were all things created. Circle the word things in your Bible. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things, circle the word things, were created by him and for him. 17. He exists before all things. Circle the word things. And by him all things. Circle it again. Hold together. He is the head of the church, the body, beginning, firstborn from among the dead. But he wasn't, you know. He wasn't the first one to rise from the dead. Lazarus rose first. The widow of Nain's son rose before he did. Isn't that true? Historically in time? Isn't that right? Jesus wasn't the first one born from among the dead. But he was the preeminent one to rise from the dead. Why? Because he came forth alone in an immortal body. They went back to the grave, but he went on to the throne of the eternal. Intercessor before the Father for the saints. So he is preeminent among the dead. Not because others didn't rise from the dead before him. They did. But because he alone is immortal. Death lasts. Death hath no more power over him. He dies no more. Preeminent from among the dead. We sing at Christmas time, Late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail incarnate deity. Pleased is man with man to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Do we ever really stop and think of those words? Though late in time, as David's son, he is preeminent over all the sons of David because he is creator of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And Jesus turned to his antagonist after quoting that passage and said, Whose son is Messiah? And they said, David's. Jesus said, Right on. He is. How then in prophecy by the Holy Spirit does David call his son Yahweh? And everybody shut up. That was the end of the conversation. How could David's son be David's Lord? Late in time beholden, but preeminent over all creation. Why? By him all things were created. And when the watchtower got to this passage, they had a terrible dilemma. Really? Up the walls. How are they going to face it? Well, there had to be a way. They took their little pens and began inserting words into the text. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him were all other things created. They inserted the word other. In heaven and earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all other things were created by him and for him. He exists before all other things, and by him all other things consist. Four times they put the word other in there. 
It's not in the Greek text any place. Because by the insertion of the word other, tampering with the text, they made Jesus one of the things created. Other things. The secret of the passage lies in the word thing. What is a thing? A creation. A creation is that which depends upon something greater than itself for its existence. So from the greatest star in the celestial galaxy to the tiniest of all atomic substructure and antimatter. And if there's anything below that, whatever it may be, the scripture clearly states that all of it was held together by the Son of God. In him all things consist because all of it was creation. He was creator. Now look at verse 17. He exists before all things. Now, we employ a little simple logic. If Jesus Christ existed before all things, he cannot be one of the things that was created. So if you are out of the category of things, you are in the only other category that there is, creator. And that is precisely the Pauline argument. He exists before all things, image of the invisible God, creator of the universe. Not that the Father created through him only, but that in him everything holds together. Now, John chapter 5, I immediately penetrated with the argument, as the Father has life in himself, so he has given the Son to have life in himself. Please notice, at this juncture it is important to go into the doctrine of what is known in theology as eternal generation. In my book, The Kingdom of the Cults, in my book, Jehovah the Watchtower, I show that the doctrine of eternal generation is derived essentially from Catholic sources. I disagree wholeheartedly with those sources. I do not believe that Jesus Christ is eternally generated by God the Father, because if I do, I find myself hopelessly involved in logical contradiction, and I find myself defending the indefensible. If I must talk of an eternal son, I am no longer talking of a son, I'm talking of a brother, because the term eternal son is totally ambiguous and absolutely contradictory. It is found no place within the pages of Scripture. The Scripture is quite adamant that before Jesus Christ came into the world, except in prophecy, he was known as the Word or the Wisdom of God. I draw to your attention John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was deity or was God. Scripture also says, as you continue reading in the passage, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, the darkness could not put it out. Please notice that. In who was life? The Son? In the Word was life. That is why the distinction is made between John 1 and John 5, so you'll never forget it. In John 1, the eternal Word is life. In John 5, He has taken upon Himself the role of Son. And quite properly, it can be said that the Father gave the Son His life. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. Hebrews chapter 1, you are my son today, I have begotten you. John chapter 1, you are my son today, I have begotten you. God did indeed beget a son through the Holy Spirit in the womb of the virgin. Now, in case you're thinking that this is some form of Martinian heresy, if you go back and read in the first five centuries of the Christian era, you will find that this is a very ancient and very old interpretation of the role of our Lord. It does not deny his eternity, it affirms it. it. simply affirms that the term son is a functional term applicable to time and space, and that it has no meaning in eternity. When I talk about father in eternity and I talk about son in eternity, I am talking linguistic nonsense, because the only way I can recognize meaning to the terms father and son is in time and space, because that's the only relationship I have to it. The Bible nowhere calls God eternal father. In Isaiah 9, 6, it calls Jesus Christ father of eternity but not eternal father. The only time the adjective eternal is applied to the Trinity is when it says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit and God is spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what are we saying? We are saying that to argue for eternal sonship is to commit yourself to a logically indefensible position. To argue for the doctrine of the eternal word who became flesh and in the moment of that incarnation assumed the role of Son of God and Son of Man is thoroughly defensible. There's no need for us to argue and defend Roman Catholic theology because it is bankrupt at that point. What you can defend biblically is the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. Nothing destroys the Jehovah's Witness argument against Christ's creativity faster than to smile at them benevolently and say, 
Oh, I don't believe in the eternal Father and the eternal Son doctrine. They say, you don't? Oh, really? What do you believe? I believe John chapter 1, in the Word was life. And in John chapter 5, the Father gave the Son life, created His body in the womb of the Virgin. So the Word is life, and He became flesh, took upon Himself our form. The Word existed from all eternity. That destroys all arguments that they have against the Son and places you squarely in the first chapter of John's Gospel, and there's no way out. They cannot backpedal from it. They just have to face it. I quoted John 1.18 to you. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. I quoted it from a Jehovah's Witness position. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. Actually, that's based upon an alternate reading of the New Testament text. And it shouldn't read the only begotten God. It should read God the only begotten one. So Jesus Christ is God only begotten. What does the word only begotten mean? Jehovah's Witnesses say only begotten from the Greek monogenes means that he was only generated, the uniquely created son. That's not the meaning of the word. Monogenes means unique, one of a kind. And Jesus Christ was unique. He entered the world as the eternal word became flesh. I cannot emphasize too strongly that you make a contrast between John 1 and John 5. In the Word was life, and the Son, when He walked among us, depended on the Father for His. You remember what He said? I by my own self can do nothing. It is the Father in me. He is performing the works. He rested completely in totality upon the Father. He lived among us as a perfect man. So when you get to John 1.18, remember it. John 1.14 says the Word became flesh, so God became flesh and walked among us. But He is not only begotten Son, He is God, the only begotten One, who lived among us in perfection. We saw last week in our study, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. We saw also that the word resurrection itself always applies to the, re to the resurrected form, to the physical form, not to the spirit or to the soul. These are all given factors in Scripture which we have to study carefully in context and be able to present. Now we move to the area of dealing precisely with Jehovah's Witnesses' arguments against the bodily resurrection. I gave you a number of passages which we want to begin to analyze and study together right now. The principal argument of the Jehovah's Witnesses against the resurrection of our Lord is basically an existential one, if we may use that term in this passage. And that is an encounter an experiential argument. Mary Magdalene, it is quite true, did not recognize Jesus in the garden. There's just absolutely no sense debating that because the passage indicates that she didn't know him. Also, the disciples on the road to Emmaus did not recognize him. So therefore, they are parallel passages in that they share a common factor. The common factor is they were incapable of recognizing the resurrected body of Jesus when they encountered him existentially or experientially. Therefore, we must look for a solution to it or acknowledge its validity. To do so, I believe, we need only go to the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, where we find tremendously interesting occurrence. The same disciples who are on the road to Emmaus talking with each other, as the record says, it came to pass that while they communed together, while they were talking and reasoning, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So we know from verse 15, that it was Jesus himself. Their eyes were holden. Circle the word holden if you have a King James. If you have a modern translation, it should read veiled or kept from recognizing him or prevented from recognizing him. That's the meaning of the Greek word. So our answer appears immediately in verse 16. The fault lay with the eyes of the disciples and with Mary, not with the form of Jesus. That is a very important point. It was not that it was not our Lord in his own body. It was that they could not recognize that body. And there must have been a reason. The reason was that their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, veiled from recognizing him, because obviously he had some purpose that he wished to communicate. If you read the context of chapter 24, the purpose is apparent. He preaches to them. Their hearts burn within them. He expounds to them the scriptures. And they are rekindled and go back rejoicing, the Lord is risen. Quite a change. But he keeps their eyes from knowing him until he demonstrates 
the validity of the Old Testament prophecies concerning his resurrection, pointing to the authority of the Scriptures as proof of what would occur, and his resurrection as confirmation of their prophetic accuracy. That, obviously, in this context, is his purpose. And others, perhaps, that we have no knowledge of, but these are apparent. In the case of Mary Magdalene, it is even more touching and beautiful. Here was a woman, history tells us, of considerable ill repute. A woman who had had seven demons cast from her by the power of our Lord. Here is a woman that the whole world could look at as the epitome of the outcast, the degraded, the forever turned aside, the person that nobody wanted or could love. And here in the garden, who comes to the cemetery at daybreak first? But Magdalena, the redeemed outcast and sinner. And she encounters him, and he does not will that she recognize him. Luke chapter 24, verse 16, same thing. Why? Because he gave her the exquisite pleasure of being able to display her undying affection and her faithfulness, her love and devotion to him who had delivered her and redeemed her and had recreated her. And then, as she pours her soul out, he says, Mary. And she says, Rabboni, beloved man. Jesus Christ took the thing that nobody would ever put any stock in, the despised, the rejected, the depraved, and the nothing. And to show that when he cleanses, that person becomes the everything that God intended. Just as he taught Peter in Acts 10, Henceforth I should call no man common nor unclean. Why? Because what God has sanctified, nobody can pronounce unclean. Mary is the vindication through the ages of the fact that the most depraved of sinners saved by grace can stand in the presence of resurrected deity and pour out their love. And he accepts it and does not rebuke them. When he revealed himself, of course, her joy knew no bounds. But the same parallel follows. She could not recognize him, not because it wasn't his body, but because for his purpose he was not ready. And then when he was, he simply said, Mary. Now I realize that people will say at this juncture, well, that's a nice explanation, and certainly it is backed up by Luke chapter 24. That's rational, logical. Very well be the best answer. Praise the Lord. But you know, the mechanics of it's a little bewildering. Very logical, but still has the air of mystery. I don't think so. We know that by inducing a state of life hypnosis, any person willing to submit to it can be given a post-hypnotic suggestion. And that immediately upon being awakened, that suggestion is in effect. That suggestion can be given to you that you will not know the person you came with tonight. And you'll pass a lie detector test. And you'll say you don't know that person. Yet your eyes will behold them. Your hands can touch them. All your senses can be brought to bear on them. But you will not know them. And that's a fact of hypnotherapy. I've seen it done. What happens? The conscious mind is given a shot of mental novocaine so that the impulses coming through the senses cannot penetrate the memory banks of the brain. It isn't that you can't see the person. It isn't that you can't feel the person. It isn't that you don't really know the person. It's that you cannot remember the person because of a hypnotic block. I submit that what man can do by hypnosis, Jesus Christ can do by simply saying, I will. And you will never know him until he says he's ready. It has nothing to do with hypnosis. It has to do with the will of God. That's what you're seeing in Luke chapter 24, verse 16. You are seeing God saying, I'm not ready yet. And their eyes were prevented from recognizing. And when he was ready, did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke to us? And Mary in the garden. Mary. Master. And we could see that in hypnosis. It wouldn't bother us at all. We'd say, oh, that's understandable. Fiddle. We see Christ do it in the garden. It's a big deal. But for us to do it hypnotically, nothing. So let's keep that thought in mind. The parallel of hypnosis can be brought in here to show that Jesus didn't utilize hypnosis. He utilized the sovereign act of will. But he could do it. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what the Scripture says he did. So much for Mary in the garden and the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It was Jesus' body. The fault was their eyes until he was ready.